Hi everyone, welcome. So this is going to be the first video tutorial uh, in a long series for our Generative Processes class. Uh, so in this video, what we're going to do is just uh, get started with p5.js and point out some of the uh, differences and some of the things you might want to be aware of coming from uh, processing. We're also going to be looking at glitch.com, which is going to be our editor for the course. And I'll talk a little bit more later about why we're going to be using a Glitch as opposed to some of the other editor options for P5.js. Uh, yeah, so let's, uh, let's dive, dive right in. OK, so this is the, uh, this is the website for P5.js. Now, uh, P5.js is a, is a JavaScript library that's uh, very much inspired by processing. And uh, right away, you're going to see, if you look at the reference here, you're going to recognize a lot of the categories of functions, a lot of the, um, the philosophy behind how things are organized uh, from processing. Uh, it is not a port of processing, so it's not exactly the same, but it's inspired by it, which is trying to make creative coding more accessible to non-programmers um, and you know, more fun to programmers. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll come back to the reference here a little, in a little bit. Uh, so the, the, fun that, the, the biggest difference between uh, processing and P5 is that processing is a JavaScript library. Uh, so JavaScript is a different programming uh, language. Processing is in Java, and uh, they're, they're pretty different beasts as far as programming languages go. But if you've learned processing already, uh, a lot of the basics that you've learned through processing in Java are going to translate to JavaScript. You're just going to have to learn a slightly different syntax. And as we go along doing exercises this semester, I'm going to be pointing out all of these differences for you. And some of these you'll probably discover on your own. Uh, so the biggest the fundamental thing about JavaScript is it was created as a client-side uh, programming, scripting programming language, which means it runs inside a web browser. Now, there are ways to run JavaScript on servers and on computers using uh, libraries like Node.js. This is probably going to be beyond the scope of this course. Uh, so as far as we're concerned, JavaScript, the scripting language that allows you to run programs from within your web browser. Um, by contrast, with Java and processing, uh, you have to go through a special plugin in order to run Java programs through the browser. Uh, so Java is primarily designed as a desktop application language. Um, so that's one of the fundamental differences. Obviously, for this course, because we're going to be online all semester, uh, JavaScript is going to be a lot more convenient uh, to share code and to uh, share projects that we're going to be making with each other, because uh, every time everything is just going to live on the web. Um, the other big difference between Java and JavaScript is that they're, they're fundamentally slightly different programming um, styles, programming languages. Java is, is, is object-oriented, uh, whereas JavaScript is kind of a little bit of everything. Uh, it's, it's more of a functional programming language. You can have objects and classes in it, but uh, that's really not its strength. Uh, so we'll see that uh, in JavaScript, you'll have a lot more flexibility than you had in Java. Uh, Java has, has much more strict rules that you have to follow, whereas JavaScript is a little bit more open-ended. And we'll, we'll, uh, that will start to make sense once we go over it, our first program. What that means is that you know, we're going to be getting away from some of the, the restrictions and like, super uh, constraints of Java in JavaScript. Uh, but also with this extra freedom, it also means that sometimes it's a little bit easier to get lost. Uh, so we'll try to keep that in mind. OK, so back to uh, P5.js here. Uh, this is a website you're going to want to bookmark, have around, primarily for the, the reference page as you, you know, get more comfortable with P5. Uh, the reference, just like with processing, is going to be your best friend. Uh, all the functions you're going to be using to draw things, to make things happen, they're all very well documented, just like in processing. Uh, so it's easy to just kind of dive in and explore and then look for examples of you know, different topics. So uh, the reference, uh, you, know, just, you probably want to have this page open when you're programming in P5.js in a separate tab. Uh, now, P5.js comes with its own uh, web editor, 
which is pretty neat. I'm going to just click on it here. Uh, you can use it for, for things. Uh, the, I've actually written a bunch of the programs for this course using the web editor uh, as a starting point. Uh, however, we're going to use glitch.com for, for our purposes for the class. Uh, so the, the P5.js uh, editor works just fine, but we're going to use another editor called glitch.com. And uh, I'll explain the reason for that in a minute. <clears throat> okay. So with P5.js, um, you don't actually have to download anything because we are going to be writing all of our code this semester inside a web browser. And using glitch.com, we're going to be uh, letting Glitch essentially create the web server for us on the fly, uh, just like the P5 editor does. Uh, so you can download P5.js if you want, if you want to run it on your computer. Uh, but this, is, this involves a few more steps you have to set up your own uh, text editor, whether it's you know something like Atom or, um, or Visual uh, Studio Code. Then you have to figure out a way to run your own uh, local web server. So there's, it's not really hard, but there's a few extra steps that we don't really need to get into for this class. Um, so we don't actually need to download anything. I'm going to show you how we're going to be referencing these P5.js libraries once we take a look at uh, glitch.com. Okay, <clears throat> so let's park uh, P5.js for a minute here, uh, this website, and let's move on to, to Glitch. Okay, so um, this is Glitch.com. It's a pretty colorful platform, as you can see. Um, and basically what it is, it's a community of uh, programmers. It's been, uh, it's, it's been designed to support people developing uh, websites, and that includes P5.js programs, but anything that runs HTML, CSS, and um, JavaScript, you can develop on, uh, on glitch.com. So you're going to be, uh, I'm going to be asking you, I've sent an email about this already. Uh, everyone will be creating an account on glitch for the course. And uh, what glitch allows you to do is if you see a program that you find interesting, uh, they have this concept <clears throat> of a remix. So uh, this is a, a basic starter program for P5.js. Uh, it's called p5.js blank, and this is what it does. Okay, it just shows an ellipse under the mouse cursor. So whenever you're going to be creating a new project this semester, a new program uh, to add to your sketches or you want to write something, the easiest thing to do is going to be to find this p5.js blank, which will be linked in a whole bunch of places, including um, our course shell on D2L and then hit this Remix button here at the bottom. Okay. <clears throat> so when you're on Glitch, um, you, know, you can view the source. It's going to load the project here in this window. Uh, we're going to dive into the source code in a little bit. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to load, usually, uh, because the, they basically put projects to sleep when they're not being used uh, in order to uh, conserve resources, uh, because the server is shared by all of the Glitch users. <clears throat> so this is going to be our starting point for all the sketches we're going to be developing uh, this term. So if we wanted to create uh, a new sketch, we would hit Remix This, and uh, that would allow us to develop, uh, sort of create a clone a copy of this blank program, um, and then sort of take it in a different direction. So after you've created your account and you're logged in, once you remix a sketch, uh, it becomes part of your own collection. And then whatever changes you make to it, uh, they become your own. They're not going to affect my original blank sketch. Um, it's going to allow you to sort of start a new, they call it a fork in the language of Glitch, uh, a new fork of that blank sketch, and then sort of build from there. So let's see what happens when we, when we remix. That's the, one of the most important things from this lesson, uh, to start a new sketch this semester with P5.js. You know, go to P5.js blank and then remix. OK. So that's going to take us to this uh, interface, which is the, the editing interface for glitch.com. And it takes a few seconds to load, but once it's loaded, we should be uh, good to go. <clears throat> so I'll give you, you know, a quick little tour of some of the important pieces here. So you'll see on the side, we have some files. Uh, these are the files associated with our project. 
um, the asset file we're not interested in. Uh, these are files that Glitch creates for us. Uh, you can also ignore this uh, JSON file here. Uh, yeah, just you don't need to dive into this. We'll just leave it there. Um, there's a, a readme.md file. That's a, just a description of the project. Then uh, the two important files here, we have index.html. That is the web page that's going to contain our p5.js script. And I'll go over the HTML in a little bit. We don't really need to learn much HTML for this course, but I'm just going to break it down just so you see what's happening. Um, and then we have the sketch itself, which is our program. And I'll go over how this program is different from a processing sketch in a second. Uh, down here, we have some, some tools. Uh, you can open up uh, different tools here. But one thing that I want to point out that's really interesting is this uh, rewind button here. Uh, so one of the cool things about Glitch is that every program that you write on Glitch uh, is actually hosted in the, in the back end behind the scenes on GitHub. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a Git repository. I'm not sure if it's hosted by GitHub, but it, it is a Git repository. Uh, so what Git is, is a way to have version control of, of programs, which means that every time you make some changes to a program, if you want to go back in time, uh, if you want to undo some of those changes, uh, you'll be able to do this with the rewind button, which is pretty sweet because we didn't get to do this within the processing uh, editor. And I'm sure a lot of you have written some programs, then have changed some things, and all of a sudden you, you break your code, you don't know how to get find your way back. With the rewind function, you can actually go back in time and see your different iterations of the program, and you can go back to a previous point, which is nice. Uh, so we'll demonstrate that maybe later on uh, in the semester. <clears throat> uh, there's some other options here. Uh, the You can invite other people to edit, uh, which we'll start to explore this in our workshops. This is really the main reason I've, I've, I went with Glitch as an editor for this semester. Uh, it's going to allow us to uh, share code with each other. And when you create your own examples, your own projects, and we have Q&A sessions, you'll be able to share your code with me and we'll be able to both work on it together in real time through the browser. So I, if I make some changes to your code or some fixes, you're going to see those changes happen and we'll be able to work together. Uh, or you'll be able to work with other students on the same program. And Glitch makes it very easy to do that. And that's really the main feature, main reason why I decided to, uh, to go with Glitch for our course. And then there's a few other options here uh, at the top. So by default, Glitch uh, gives you a pretty, a pretty random name for your project. You can change the name to something more meaningful. Excuse me. Um, you can choose to make a project private. So if you click on this button here, uh, it will make it private, which means it won't appear if people search for it on Glitch or if they go to your account. So if you're just you know, messing around with some ideas you don't want to share, you can make them private. Uh, and then you can, you know, my, I use a dark theme because the some white screen bothered my eyes after a while. So you can change the theme if you prefer. Uh, yeah, so there's like some options here, keyboard shortcuts and so forth. <clears throat> so uh, if we want to see the outcome of our code here, we can click on the Show button, and uh, we can either see the outcome in a new window. So this would be similar to what in processing when you hit the Play button, it would just open a separate window for the sketch. Or we can see our code and then the output of our code side by side. Uh, so this is the mode that we're going to use for the most part, because we'll be able to right away see the changes we make to the code, how they affect uh, the visuals and the program. And so we're going to choose this option. And we can resize the window if we want to. So on the right, this is what our program is doing. And on the left, this is the code for our program. All right. So let's uh, take a look at the JavaScript code. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing that we need to point out here is this keyword called function. So in JavaScript, their, um, every function is going to be defined using the keyword function. Uh, there is no void keyword anymore, and functions don't have a return type either. And the reason for that is because in JavaScript, there are no types. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So 
uh, in, in Java, you know, you remember we would write void setup uh, in JavaScript. We're going to write function setup instead. So that is the first thing to get uh, used to. So every function is just going to be start with the keyword function. So just like in processing, right, we have setup. You remember setup is the function that runs once in the beginning of our program, and we use it to set some initial conditions, uh, do you know a little bit of of uh, setting things up literally so things like setting the window size uh, and so forth then we have draw still exists so they use the same language from processing and draw is the main uh, the main rendering loop so it's the function that repeats over and over after setup has run once and that allows us to create some animated drawing in the on the canvas inside the browser uh, so setup and draw is the same concept as processing they're still there uh, we just have to use the keyword function. So instead of void setup and void draw, we say function setup, function draw. But otherwise, you can see that the structure of it is similar, right? We have parentheses to indicate it's a function, and then we have the curly brackets to indicate here's a little block of code, right? With the open and close curly bracket. Uh, the glitch editor will highlight the closing one for you, which is nice. Um, so this is the start and end of the draw function. This is the start and end of the setup function. Okay. So <clears throat> first difference, no more void. Now we use function instead. All right, moving on to this line. Um, the other big difference to get used to is coming from the processing world is that in processing, we would use a size. Okay? We would do something like create the size, right? set the size for our window. Now, in, uh, in the world of JavaScript, uh, they don't use the size function. Instead, they've created a function called create canvas. Uh, the reason it's called canvas is because P5.js, behind the scenes, uh, uses an object part of the browser called the, the HTML canvas to do all of its drawing. So they use the word canvas here, and it's kind of in line with the processing sort of lingo of sketching and drawing and painting. So we're drawing on the canvas. Now here I've used the, the keywords window width and window height, right? So these are similar to um, width and height and processing, except they refer to the size, you know, the actual size of the browser window. You, know, you could also have a fixed uh, canvas. For example, if I replace these with numbers, you'll see that I could have just a fixed canvas, right? Now I only have this 400 by 400 pixel area that I can draw within. And then the rest of it is just a is just a blank HTML page, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know we're in the browser, so we might as well just fill our sketches and use up all the space available, because uh, why not? So we're gonna get into the habit of creating our um, <clears throat> oops window width and window height. We're going to get into the habit of creating every sketch from now on with just with this line here. We're just going to say whatever the size of the window we have to work with, this is going to now be the width of our sketch and the height of our sketch. Now in uh, in P5.js, we also have this additional little function here, uh, which we didn't have in regular processing because there was no way to resize the window after we created it. Uh, but because now we're inside a browser, uh, you know, I can I can resize my browser, right? The browser can change, right? It can be it can be resized, as you know. So to respond to this, there is an event. So events are functions that are called whenever a particular thing happens. Uh, so remember we had events like mouse pressed, key pressed. Well, one of these events in uh, in P5 is window resized. So that code triggers whenever the user decides to resize the browser window. And we're going to respond to that by calling the resize canvas function. So that's going to sort of, it's like a something we can call just the same way we call in setup. Um, create canvas just is when we first create it. And resize canvas is when we want to just not recreate the whole canvas from scratch, but just adjust the size of it. Um, so with these two functions, right, now we have a, uh, a canvas that will adjust itself to whatever space is available. So that's just kind of convenient. Okay. All right. So moving on here, 
Uh, we're going to dive into draw, and then we're going to point out some, uh, some key differences from processing here as well. So draw here is doing two really simple things. It's setting a gray background and then drawing a circle. And you remember mouse X, mouse Y are the same as from processing. They represent the X and Y coordinates of the mouse cursor. And 50 here is the size of my circle that I'm drawing. So if I put in a bigger value, <clears throat> I have a bigger circle. So there's a few differences here in P5GS that are worth pointing out um, that we need to be aware of. Uh, the first one is you may have noticed, but as I've been making some changes, to the code, I don't have to hit, you know, there is no play button anywhere, just like in processing. This is one of the really nice things about uh, working in JavaScript and P5.js, because the environment is always updating itself. It's always refreshing, and that's something that uh, Glitch is also doing very well. So as I make changes to my code here, <clears throat> uh, I don't have to hit play. It's automatically going to reflect those changes as soon as I'm done typing. Uh, so this is like a really nice feature where it's, it's much more dynamic and working on your code feels a little bit more responsive. So it's less of that play, you know, stop cycle, change some code, run the code, see what happens. Now we can interact with the code in real time a little bit more. So this, it's nice, it's more responsive and it's easier to tweak things and see immediately see what changes you make, what, what effect they have on the code. So it lends itself a little bit better to, to some experimentation. OK, so background, again, the same as in processing. It erases the background window uh, of a certain color. But you'll notice here uh, earlier, so background 0 right, is black. Background 255 is white. So those ideas still apply. You know, This is going to be a red background. So I, you know, I'm not going to brush up on RGB colors. Uh, so one way we can do colors in, in JavaScript is like this. Uh, but JavaScript and P5.js also have a lot more ways we can define color. Uh, we can define colors as hexadecimal, like so. Uh, we can also use HTML color names which is kind of nice because, you know, sometimes you get tired of saying 255 for white or zero for black. So if I wanted to have a black background, I can also write black. Okay. Now, if you're curious, um, HTML color names, there's a whole bunch of standard ones. <clears throat> I'm going to just search here for HTML color names. Click on the first link that pops up. Uh, here's uh, the, the 140 uh, color names that are supported by all the browsers. So obviously, there's some really um, uh, easy one to guess, like blue and black uh, and red and so forth. But there's some other interesting colors. So if you want to refer to these colors by name in P5.js, uh, you can do that. For example, you know we might want to have a light sky blue as our background. So it will respond to that <clears throat> as well. So this is a, kind of a neat feature. All right. Now, uh, as a little reminder here, that color name, I'm, I'm inputting it as a, a string. So remember, in, in processing, strings always had double quotes between them, and single quotes were for characters. Now, in P5.js, there isn't that distinction. So a string can be a single quote. It can also be a double quote. It's the same difference. Okay, so we're going to kind of use both interchangeably. Um, but just be aware that if you see this, uh, as long as you're consistent, so I cannot start my string with a double quote and then end it oops, with a single quote, that's not going to work. So I got to pick one, um, and the text is going to change color to show that this is actually a, a string as opposed to any keyword that I'm typing. So P5.js doesn't care if we use single or double quotes uh, for strings. All right. Um, and then here, in this uh, little bit, we're uh, drawing a circle. So one thing uh, that you may have noticed is we have a function called circle in P5.js, which is nice because in processing, we got used to doing ellipses right, a lot. Uh, but really, like when's the last time you actually draw, drew an ellipse in processing, 
uh, so stroke of genius, the folks who developed p5.js decided that uh, let's put in a circle function is there in there as well because you know a circle only has a single number as its diameter. So just kind of a little convenience thing here. So a circle draws a circle at mouse x, mouse y, and this is the diameter, uh, size 50. And then that's the end here of our uh, draw function. And again, remember, if you put the background in setup, right, what's going to happen is it's only going to clear the background once, and then it allows you to draw on top of it. And sometimes we'll, sometimes we'll take advantage of that. If you put the background in draw, uh, it clears the background at the beginning of every frame, so you can create more of an animation uh, without having to build on top of what you drew previously. So let's move the background to uh, setup for now. Okay. I'm going to move the comment along with it, just in case we forget. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, we talked about colors here. Um, so we said, you know, we can have numbers as colors. We can have uh, strings as colors. Uh, this is a good time to sort of jump back to the reference in P5.js and point out different ways that color can be represented. Um, so if I was trying to remember, you know, what, how can I represent colors? Again, the reference is your best friend. Uh, so I'm going to click on reference here. And we're going to look for color. <clears throat> And let's go at, you know, maybe we can look at the, the fill function to get some examples, or we can look at the, the color function. And then you'll see there's like lots of different ways we can, uh, we can support colors in uh, P5.js. We can do RGB, right? We can use name colors. We can use color codes. Uh, we can specify colors as these strings like this, saying RGB with the color number. Um, and then there's all these other different format, hue, saturation, lightness, HSB, hue, saturation, brightness, and, uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. <clears throat> and uh, we can sort of use these interchangeably. So again, it's a good example of when to go back to the reference if uh, there's something you're not, you're not sure about. Okay. So, so far we've covered some of the differences between processing and Java. We said there is no more void keyword, so we use the word function instead. There's no more size function. We use create canvas instead. Colors now are not just represented by numbers. We can also use strings and lots of different variations. Uh, because the window can be resized in JavaScript, we also have a little event here to, to handle this scenario. And that's a kind of an optional bit that I've included in our template. Uh, but I figured it's nice to have in every sketch because if you run it in a separate window, you can sort of go full screen or make the window smaller and the sketch will adjust itself accordingly. Um, and then we have our draw function, just like in processing. And then within that, we can use all the, the different drawing functions and then the ones that we're going to be coming up with eventually. So instead of, uh, in, in addition to ellipse, we also have access to circle and all the other ones that we use with processing like rect and line and point and so forth. Okay. Now, obviously there are many more differences uh, between P5.js and uh, Java processing. And you're going to discover some of these as you experiment uh, but the last one I want to, to uh, really cover in this video is the idea that uh, actually two more, two more differences. Um, the, la the first, the, one I, the thing I want to point out is uh, how do we create variables in P5.js? Now, this is a really fundamental difference, and it's a pretty important one to talk about in our first video. So in processing, uh, we would create variables. <clears throat> you know, let's say I wanted to make a variable to hold the, uh, the diameter value of my circle. In processing, I would write something like this. I would write int diameter equal 50, and then in the circle, I would replace this with uh, diameter. Now in JavaScript, of course we can create variables, but the big difference is JavaScript get, does away with types altogether. Okay, so in JavaScript, there are no more types. Um, what are types? Well, it's int right, in processing, 
And some of the main ones we used were, you know, float, for example. So every variable we created in processing needed to have a data type associated with it. And we can then only use this data type inside this variable for the rest of our program. Okay. So Java means it's that what that means is it's a strongly typed language. So when we define something, whether it's a function, it needed to have a return type. Variables needed to have a type. In JavaScript, this idea just uh, goes away altogether. So when we create a variable, it's just going to be a variable, and we can put whatever we feel like inside that variable. So the keyword to declare variables in JavaScript is going to be uh, let. There's actually three different keywords we can use to define variables, and we'll talk about the differences in a second. So if I say let diameter equals 50, what that means is I'm creating a variable called diameter. I'm setting its initial value to 50, and then I can use it in my code whenever I want to refer to that value. Uh, just like in processing, we can create local variables. That means they exist inside some curly brackets. So this diameter variable is only going to be available in between these two curly brackets. If I move it to setup, for example, right? <clears throat> now this diameter, right? nothing is happening uh, because it doesn't know what diameter is. And here I'm getting a little warning. It's saying diameter is a sign of value, but never used. Okay? So variables have a scope in JavaScript, just like in processing. Uh, you can also make global variables by just declaring them outside of the scope of any function or code block. So now this is a global variable. Now, you may have noticed when I put this variable inside, um, inside setup, my circle disappeared here, and uh, I don't get any errors. Right? The program still run, still runs just fine. And the reason for that is that uh, you know, I don't get, we don't see the console by default, the, uh, the JavaScript console. <clears throat> I don't think logs is what it is. Um, so if you want to see the output of the console while you're prog programming, um, that's going to vary from browser to browser. But on Chrome, you're going to open the developer tools. Now, I do recommend you use Chrome if you can for these uh, tutorials. Uh, what we develop is going to work on all the different browsers. But if uh, for consistency, um, if you can install and use Chrome, uh, it's it's going to ensure that whatever we're building is going to work fine on the browser that you're using. Uh, so Chrome has this uh, option here under, uh, so under the menu, right? Under More Tools has this option called Developer Tools, and if you click on this, it's going to open this, uh, you know, funny li little uh, window here with lots of different options, right? So this is like super overkill for what we're doing. But we're going to look at the console specifically. And you see that now where I'm getting some errors that are starting to pop up. So every time draw repeats, right? <clears throat> I'm going to clear the console here. And I'm going to update my sketch. See, now I'm getting errors. So this is one of the drawbacks of switching to P5.js. Uh, it's a little bit harder to find the issues when they occur because the language is much more forgiving. Notice it didn't really crash the program. It just, it just didn't do anything um, when I tried to use diameter that was defined over in setup. Okay. If I move it inside draw, now it's happy again, and it's working. Okay. And I no longer get the, uh, the errors. Okay. I can clear the console, and everything's fine. So we'll talk a little bit more about the console in, in future uh, lessons and tutorials. But just know that as you're developing with P5.js, uh, the one thing that's not as nice in P5.js uh, as processing is, is when it comes to error messages and figuring out what's wrong in your code. Uh, because you have a lot more flexibility, you know, we don't have data types anymore, for example. Um, I'll point out some of that flexibility also in a second. It also means that there are things, you know, you can write things that will go wrong, and it may be a little trickier to figure out where it's going wrong. 
Uh, processing does a very good job at highlighting, you know, which line of your code gives an error and so forth. Uh, P5.js, not as much. Um, so when, uh, when things go awry, it can be a little harder to figure out uh, why that is exactly. Like for example, right now, my background is no longer sky blue. Okay, there it is. I had to just make a change and reload the sketch. And that is because when I resize it, right? When I resize the window, I actually don't reset the background either. So let's also fill the background inside window resized. All right. So in P5.js, uh, you're going to have to get better at troubleshooting your programs and sort of doing the detective work, figuring out where things go wrong. You're going to have fewer um, clues and hints as to why things happen. Uh, but still, if you you know you just write something wrong here, I forget some keywords. I will get some errors uh, in the console that will you know point out the line number and so forth. It's just not as nicely packaged as with processing. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, so back to variables. So in JavaScript, uh, like like we said, variables can be anything. The keyword we're going to use to declare variables is the keyword uh, let. There's another keyword that exists called var, which you might run into uh, if you look at other people's code. Uh, var is very similar to, uh, to let. The only difference has to do with the scope of the variable. So when you create a variable with var, um, I don't want to get too deep into this because that we don't really need to know this uh, at this time. Uh, but it, the variable will exist for the whole duration of the function. And it will also uh, exist in, in some of the sub subsections of the, the scope. Okay? Uh, so the, the scope of var is a little bit different than the scope of let. And generally speaking, uh, to me anyways, this is more intuitive. Uh, there is no reason to really use var over let um, for the purposes of our course. Just think of them as the same, because you're going to run into examples that use var and you're going to run into examples that use let as well. And uh, just think of them as equivalent. We're not going to get too deep into the differences. I'm going to be using let for the most part. Uh, it's a more modern version of declaring variables in JavaScript, whereas var is kind of the old style. So we're going to learn the modern way right away. Uh, and there are you know some obscure special cases where var makes most sense, but we're really not interested in those, at least on not the kinds of the kind of coding we're doing um, for this class or in or in general for new media type stuff. Uh, so it's not that critical. Uh, the other keyword we can use to declare a variable in JavaScript is the keyword uh, const. So const is kind of like let, where it creates a variable, uh, except it says this variable is constant, which means it's not going to change. So if I try to modify it later on, <clears throat> we're going to get some errors, right? Here it's telling me error assignment to a constant variable. Okay? So if you say const when you declare a variable, you're sort of just kind of signing a contract that said, here's a variable that's never going to change. Okay? Um, this can be useful for a number of reasons. Um, one of those is performance sometimes. Uh, those are faster variables on the back end uh, than variables that can change. And if you're going to have, have lots of iterations using some variables, uh, you, know, you can get some performance from, from const. Uh, it also allows you to set things up so that if you really intend for something not to change ever, by declaring it as a const, uh, you will get warned if something in your code tries to change it down the road. Okay? Now, in practice, for the programs that we're going to be writing in this course, using const over let is a little bit of overkill, to be honest. It's not necessary. Uh, so for the most part, we're just going to be using let uh, as our variables. We're not going to create constant variables that cannot be changed. We'll just assume every variable can be changed. And uh, if we ever run into a situation where it really makes sense to declare a const, we'll revisit it. Uh, the reason I point I pointed out is that uh, if you if you look at code examples, if you read other people's code, you might see that keyword, and uh, now at least you'll you'll know what it is. Uh, so, for our purposes, 
And from a practical standpoint, right, we can consider all of these to be functionally similar, which means they just create a variable that, uh, that we can then use in the code. All right. So in JavaScript, um, there are no data types, uh, which means every variable is just called, is just defined using uh, let. And every, any variable can store anything. Now, of course, if I put a string in here, I can, uh, but I'm going to get some errors because, you know, it doesn't make sense for this parameter of circle here to be a string. Okay? So we're still going to have to be consistent as to what types of information, what types of data we put into our variable. Uh, it still has to make sense. So diameter should be a number. Therefore, we're going to put a number in here. However, uh, for example, it can be a float, right? It's not a big difference of a half a pixel, I can't tell. But uh, we don't have to worry about types anymore. So there's no difference between an int or a float. You know, it's just a variable. Okay? And they can, it can contain anything. So in that way, JavaScript is a lot more flexible when you're programming. And uh, you're going to trip over. You're going to trip over these things less than in processing, which in the beginning of, of learning Java and processing, I, this can be hard for, for people who are starting to just remember all these different data types and then remember the difference between them and know when to declare one or the other. JavaScript is more forgiving. So we can just say, here's a variable. I'm going to put whatever I want in it and call it a day. Now, just like in, uh, just like in processing, we can also assign the, the output of a function directly into a variable. Uh, so for example, we still have similar functions than we, that, than we had access to in processing, like the map function. Remember map, our best friend? So map, <clears throat> map takes an input, right? And then you tell it, what is the minimum and maximum value of this input? And then it's going to map it. It's going to translate it into another range where you get to define a new minimum and a new maximum. Okay. <clears throat> so for example, we could map the mouse cursor x coordinate, which we know varies between 0 and width. Right. So we still have access to a lot of similar concepts as in processing. We still have the width variable. Uh, we're going to map this to, let's say, a number between uh, 0 and 50. Now, as I move my cursor, I get some smaller circles over here. I get some larger circles over here. Okay. So <clears throat> these are all things we could do with processing. We can do the exact same things with uh, P5.js. Uh, the only difference is we don't have a type anymore. Uh, we can also uh, change some of the basic drawing parameters. Like, for example, I could turn off the fill. No fill. So it's it should feel feel very familiar, right? Because it is almost the same as processing, um, with some differences in some of the basic syntax of the language. Uh, I could set a stroke. Maybe we'll set a, a white stroke. Maybe I'm going to go back to black here for my background. Um, we can also do like, you know, I could do white. Uh, we could do numbers like this. Uh, we can also have opacity, right? Alpha values, just like in processing. Uh, so very similar in that way. <clears throat> uh, here, for fun, let's do another way of looking at the diameter. Uh, we're going to set the diameter to be uh, the distance between the mouse cursor right? and uh, the previous position of the mouse cursor. That is P mouse X and P mouse Y. Cool. So now if my mouse moves just a little bit, I get tiny little circles. And if I make big motions, I get big circles. All right. Okay. Now, um, the final difference we're going to highlight here in this first intro uh, to P5.js sketch between P5.js and processing uh, is going to be this mind-blowing fact. 
Now mp5.js, you don't actually even need to put some semicolons in your code. Okay? That's pretty sweet. So see, notice I'm getting rid of semicolons here. Still works, all right? Um, <clears throat> it's still a good habit to put them in, okay? Because the assumption, uh, p5.js will, or JavaScript will make some assumptions based on how your code is formatted. And if you go to a new line here, right, it's going to assume, all right, this is a, you know, it's still giving me some warnings, but it will work, okay? Uh, it will assume this is a new command, this is a new line, right? Uh, it won't work if you put them on the same line, of course, because now you would really need the semicolon in there to do the separation. Uh, but they're not absolutely necessary. Now, because you've already got into some good habits with processing in Java, uh, you can, I keep putting them in, right? Because I'm used to it and it's probably a good idea. Uh, there are some really obscure edge cases where if you forget a semicolon, it might result in some behavior that I mean, is a little unexpected, but those cases are really uncommon. Uh, we're not gonna run into this most likely in this course. Um, what that means though, is that this is a lot more forgiving when you're just messing around, trying some new ideas, trying to figure things out, you know, you're you're not going to have that barrier in processing where just like forgetting a semicolon at the end just breaks your whole sketch. Uh, so in P5.js, uh, the semicolons are optional. Um, I would recommend still putting them in out of habit, especially if you ever go back to processing for some reason, you need to build a, a desktop app. It's going to be painful to remember to put those semicolons in. So if you have that habit, put them in. But if you forget one, your code is still going to run. It's not the end of the world. OK. All right, so let me rename here this remix I just did, because this is a pretty abstract title. Um, I'm going to call this P5.js First Steps. Okay. And I'm going to put a little description, just getting started with p5.js. Cool. All right. So before you move on to uh, before you move on to the next tutorial, I think probably a good idea would be just spend a little bit of time building this program, going to glitch.com, remixing my uh, p5.js blank sketch. Uh, so remember going back here to the beginning, I'm going to open I'm going to go back to glitch. So p5.js blank. Um, again, I'll be providing links for these uh, for this one in the video description, also on D2L. Uh, so this is your starting point for a new um, new p5.js sketch, and just spend a little bit of time um, messing around, trying different drawing things, some of the commands you remember from processing, just to get familiar with the uh, the environment. Oh, and one more thing. I just realized we didn't go back to this index.html page. So we're going to cover this before we wrap up this tutorial. So uh, the two components of a P5.js program are the script, right? So we have our sketch.js here, which is our, our program. And then this script has to be embedded inside an HTML page because P5.js runs in the browser. Um, so we're always going to be using this template for our HTML page that's going to house our script. And you'll see it's a very simple, um, simple template. Okay. There's a <clears throat> here if you want to modify the the window, the title of the window, you could do that here. Um, I'm going to, you know, I'm not seeing the title window here because we're inside a, we're inside Glitch. But if you open this as a standalone uh, program, you know, I could, I could change the the window title. Uh, <clears throat> this is a tag here, which is going to make it a bit easier for the viewport to work on different devices. Um, here we have a little bit of uh, CSS or style sheet uh, language uh, that basically just gets rid of the um, <clears throat> uh, any kind of outline we might have outside the around our sketch. It just it just puts a, a zero padding around our canvas so that our sketch goes all the way to the edge of the of the window. Right? If we put in a different padding here. And margin. See, we would be stuck with. Uh, I'm gonna close the console here. We'd be stuck with a white border around our sketch, which you know maybe is something you want down the road. Um, but 
for our template for the course. Uh, we're just going to have no padding, so it goes all the way to the edge. Um, and then the, the important little bit here, this is how we actually bring p5.js uh, into the browser. This is how we actually bring the library um, p5.js into our code. So we have these three script tags here. We have the sketch.js, that is the sketch we're writing ourselves. And this is the last one always. Uh, this is These script tags are including different JavaScript files. And here we're using a server uh, called Cloudflare to just fetch a particular version of p5.js right? and then uh, just download it every time we, we run this, uh, this web page. So instead of loading it, um, including it in our files in the sketch, we're just going and grabbing it uh, from the web, which is a pretty common thing to do. Uh, so this script tag here is really important because it, that's what actually brings in p5.js into the into our website. Um, in our blank template, I've also added another script tag because um, we're going to be reusing that that p5.js blank for all the new programs we're making. Um, this is for another library which I'm going to cover uh, in next week's series of tutorials. This is a, a graphical user interface library called that.gui. And um, I've included it in the template because uh, starting next week, we're going to make heavy use of that library also. Uh, so this brings in p5.js. This brings in that GUI. And this brings in the script that we're actually writing. So you don't actually need to mess with the HTML in this template. Uh, I just wanted to show you what was going on in there. Uh, it is just a blank page, right? There's nothing in the body of the page. Um, in theory, you know, you could, when you write p5.js, because it's in the browser, you can actually combine your p5.js script with HTML elements. You know, you can mix and match anything you can do in a web browser. Uh, you can do inside uh, or outside of p5.js. You can have other stuff inside the web page here, uh, <clears throat> right? So now I'm writing some some text, just a HTML text, but we're going to treat the, the, the browser window as our canvas in the same way that processing would just give us a, a window for our program. Uh, so I don't have anything in the body. Um, we're going all the way to the edges. And then in our sketch, uh, we're creating a canvas that fills the entire window. Uh, but it's just good to point out that because we're programming now in the web browser with p5.js, there's lots of interesting things you can do with the HTML and sort of combine p5.js and then more traditional HTML elements um, that's way beyond the scope of this intro tutorial and even this class probably, uh, but it's, it's good to know it's out there. Okay. So on that note, um, uh, try to see if you can replicate this sketch, then start changing some things, start messing around and I'll see you in the next lesson for this week.